start to learn about. Um, and we're going to really begin the idea of analyzing like simple, simple structures. Now, anything you learn in life, you have to learn the fundamentals of. For example, when you learn how to multiply, before multiplying, you actually have to learn how to add. Because multiplication is really just adding. That's all it is, except you just add it many times over and over again. So you learn the building block before you go into the more complicated thing. We're going to start, and we're going to learn about forces and moments. We're going to talk about forces and moments, but specifically, specifically how they're related to simple fixed structures. These structures might be beams. They might be a bridge that connects two different uh, ends of like two different pieces of land. But we're going to go with a simple, simplified model for a lot of these to start. Then, if you take this idea of what we're going through and really want to extrapolate it or go a lot further, you'll see how a lot of bridges are comprised of a lot of the shapes and the structures that we're going to talk about. Um, so what I thought was, so last year we did a project, and I wanted to change it up a little bit. So I told you guys already about the bridge, and, I, and we're going to do that project for sure. But I want to do a project before that that we didn't do last year. Uh, and I think it'll be a little bit more A, interesting, and B, a little bit easier to work with than the bridge to start, kind of like to build us up to that level. Um, and it was a project when I was in high school that we actually did, and it was called a boom lever. Uh, and the term boom lever simply means something that is suspended off of a building that is holding some weight. And usually a good example would be like the flagpole outside. The flagpole comes out from the building, and then the flag itself hangs. I know there's not much weight in the flag because it's fabric, but there is some weight hanging, <coughs> and the wind does catch it sometimes. That's why you see like those little holes in the flag itself, so that the flag doesn't literally get pulled off. Um, so the first project we're going to start with, and we're going to spend today going through this idea of lecture. You're going to do a little bit of an online activity that shows you more about these types of deformation that you can understand for this. Um, tomorrow we're going to finish more math and lecture, and then we're going to start the boom lever. I think I want to start it in your next, so today's day six, then there's day one, your next day three. Okay, to keep track. So today's day six, Wednesday, which is tomorrow, we'll do another period of this to finish the lecture notes that I want to talk about, some math involved. There's a good amount of math in this section. So for those of them are waiting for math, here it is. For those that have been fearing math, here it is. Yeah. Um, and then on Friday, what you can start is the beginning of your boom lever project. And what you can do on Friday is really come up with your design, right, your design based on A, research, and B, the stuff we cover in class. Okay, there's a, a, again, like your last project, you're going to want to do a good amount of research to understand what some of the best ideas are. I'm going to go through some of the ideas and give you some hints along the way as we do it. Um, now, for today, let's start these notes on forces and moments. Now, in the beginning, we're going to review stuff, including forces, that you should see as familiar from last year in physics. If you don't, I'm kind of annoyed, I guess, but you did see it last year in my class. I think there's only one person that wasn't in my class last year. And I know he definitely understands this. So we're going to take a look at the ideas of forces. Then we're going to go into the ideas of moments and torque. Um, I did not teach about torque last year in our physics section. I know I think you did, or you're learning about it. You did last year, right? Yeah. OK. Uh, I'm trying to think back. That's why. I know Mr. Donachek covered it last year in his AP class. But I don't think he covered it in honors two years ago. But you were in there last year, actually. Yes. Um, and then we're going to talk about moment formulas and these tables that are used to calculate how much force or torque is acting on a body at a given location. So you can see, like, if the stress exceeds a certain value, the actual object may fail. And you're going to utilize these concepts to understand where, hopefully, where, hopefully, your boom lever does fail. And I don't mean hopefully it fails, I mean hopefully you can figure out where that is. Okay? And then continuing that idea onto the bridge. But before we get to the bridge, we're going to do a lot of this stuff. And then before the bridge, we're going to talk about truss structures. Uh, and we'll see that idea actually in the second period today um, if you have time to get to it. Depends on how far you get through the activity in the second period. All right, so let's begin just simply the idea of a force. Okay, and a lot of you use the force meter that measured the amount of force that was applied for your reverse engineering project. Some of you did, some didn't. Uh, but the idea behind it is that a force is defined as a push or a pull. A push or a pull. Now, a force generally, when we look at dynamics and motion, is something that causes acceleration. How do we know it causes acceleration? Newton's law tells us F equals MA. The more net force acting on it, 
the more acceleration as a result of that object. Now, <clears throat> if I push against the wall, ready? I push, I push harder, I push even harder. While I'm applying more force, why isn't the wall accelerating? Yeah, the, war, the, the wall itself is pushing back. So the net force on the wall is still zero, actually. If you look at the whole system, right? I'm pushing against the wall, but it has to have some sort of a reaction. So the wall is pushing back with, let's say, a normal force in this case coming off the wall. If I put the iPad down on the desk, why isn't the iPad falling through the desk? Well, the normal force is pushing back, so it's still in a state of equilibrium. It's when the net force acting on an object is not zero that it accelerates. So for the sake of our projects coming up, what situation do you want? Think about the two projects I just mentioned, the boom lever and the bridge. For those kinds of structures or those projects or those ideas, what do you want the scenario to be? Do you want there to be a net force that causes acceleration? Do you not want there to be? Do you not care? Yes, no, why? Explanations? What do you think? What do you propose for a simple example like this with a boom lever and a bridge? What do you want? Well, for the bridge, you want it to be in equilibrium so that the bridge doesn't collapse. You definitely want the bridge to be in equilibrium. What might the bridge do? It might happen, and you have to understand how to figure this out. What's going to happen on a bridge? If it's, uh, like, okay, so if it gets pretty warm, yeah, very good. And in the second period today, actually, you're going to talk about how temperature varies, and as a result of the varying temperature, the structural components have to change. That was one part of it, yeah. So it could either expand or contract on the bridge. What about wind? What would wind cause the bridge to do? Yeah, it might cause the vibrator to move or sway a little bit. So there needs to be a little bit of give. And a little bit of give means that the bridge needs to be able to bend a little bit. Believe it or not, the floor that you're walking on bends a little bit. Very, very little, to the point where it's not even, you know, notice it, obviously. But these buildings have to be able to absorb some sort of shock. And you'll notice that in places that are on fault lines, that they build structures now. And we talked about it earlier in here. I think, Mike, you talked about the One World Trade Center. Or was it? Somebody mentioned the centerpiece, though. Wasn't it you? Oh, yeah. It was you, right? My bad, Mike. Um, but the idea of that centerpiece, that heavy mass down the center, absorbs the shock. Um, so in this section, we're going to talk about forces and moments and how they affect structures, but the idea generally for statics is that the net force should be zero. Okay, as Julia said, it should be in a state of equilibrium. We do not want there to be any cause for acceleration. If the bridge starts accelerating, it's only going to accelerate down, which means it falls, it collapses. Okay, so you do not want a net force at all. Now. The usual force that we consider for these structures are contact forces, contact forces, and gravity forces. And when we talk about gravity, we talk about the weight, and there are two different types of weights. It's called the dead load and a live load. The weight of the desk sitting there by itself is the dead load, meaning it's the actual weight of the structure. The minute you start putting stuff on the desk, I take my laptop, I put it on the desk, I'm varying the live load on the desk. Again, the weight of the object itself is called a dead load. The actual stuff you put onto this and you add onto here is called a live load. And that's what varies over time. So a bridge, the live load is always varying. The, the dead load is pretty much constant. The weight of the bridge itself isn't changing, mm -hmm. but the cars traveling on it are considered a live load. That's what the variable is here. Um, the, same, uh, the same goes... The same goes for the flagpole outside. Now this is a little bit intriguing and it's kind of difficult to visualize. What varies, what varies that causes different stresses and strains and net forces on the flagpole outside? The wind, yeah. And that's, it's not obvious because the wind is what's called the distributed load. A, a force that acts not at a specific location but over an entire body is called the distributed load. For example, if I take my stylus and stand it up on its end, which I don't even know if this is possible on this desk, maybe it is, it is. That would be a point load, and it would be fixed on that exact location. Now, granted, the surface area of the stylus is some value, but generally it's fixed right there. Now look at my iPad. My iPad is taking a certain amount of weight, and it's distributing it over a certain surface. So there are distributed loads and point loads, or fixed loads. So we're talking in general about dead loads meaning the weight of the object, a live load being something added to it. Now a live load itself 
can be either distributed or point load. So if I stand on a certain location, this would be more like a point load or a point force. If I were to lay down, it would be like a distributed one. Um, if you think about an example of this, have you ever seen somebody lay on a bed of nails? Okay, why can they do that? Because of the distributed load, because the pressure decreases. We talk about pressure in physics as force over area. So if you could distribute that area more, it's less pressure. And I did this simple example, if you try to stand on one foot, it's a little bit harder, because you have half the area, which means double the pressure. Now try to lift yourself up and hold yourself up, suddenly it becomes very difficult, because your area and contact is now like a third of a half. So you go from a certain amount of area, and now you're at one-sixth of the area, which means the pressure is six times that much on that location. So when we talk about distributed loads and point loads, we're really referring to pressure. Okay, we're really referring to pressure, and we're going to see that in this section, how these things occur. Okay, a lot of stuff that I'm speaking about that is not on here, you guys can see. So when you have your quiz on forces and moments, you can expect the questions on things that I'm talking about right now, like live loads and dead loads and distributed loads and point loads and all that stuff. Um, the three examples that we want to really focus on, weight we talked about already, and that's the dead load, weight. Now, generally though, for structures, you have normal force and frictional force. Those two things are extremely important. Why is normal force important? Why is it important to understand the normal force when it comes to a structure? What is the normal force? Who remembers from physics? What's the normal force? Yeah. James? It goes up as a response to what, James? Gravity. Yeah, as a response to the weight of an object or gravity from some other object. It's really a response to some other force. That's what the normal force really is. And we know that it acts perpendicular. So if you have a bottom floor and then six floors on top of it, the bottom floor has to support the other floors, doesn't it? So we have a lot of problems where the normal force is involved. And then finally, the frictional force, where might that be involved? Where might the frictional force be involved? Think about structures now I'm talking about, okay, structures. We're on a bridge. We're on a bridge, which you can include normal or frictional force. If it's curved. It's curved. Be more specific. What do you mean? Between the car and the road, you're saying? Yeah. Okay, but in the structure inherently, in the structure inherently, where might friction play a role? It's not obvious. It's really not obvious. It's the hard thing. I forgot what they're called, like the metal, the metal like ropes that connect to the bridge that might not be connected. Suspension cables? Yeah. So they have to have enough friction force to get through the eye holes. They're usually they're usually fixed. Yeah, they're usually fixed with either some sort of like a, a giant bolt that goes through yes. or a rivet or something. Where might friction play a role? It's not obvious because earlier we talked about how structures should be statically determined. They should be stable, right? But when a structure isn't stable is where friction plays a role. When like the wind comes by and it causes something to shake or when cars go over the bridge, or when, as Peter said, the temperature changes. Okay, friction is going to play a role when there's any sort of like motion between two parts of this giant structure. Remember, friction is a contact force. It's a contact force. There has to be motion. So that's why it's not obvious that, strict, that, fr that friction is utilized for structures, because usually you think of a structure as something that is fixed. It's not moving. Right? You don't want a bridge to move much. But when it does vary or vibrate or move very lightly, there is friction involved there. Okay? Those are the three main four. Now, we talked about this in physics. We should definitely know how to do this already. But to reiterate the definition of this, a free body diagram, a free body diagram is something that indicates the force is acting on the object. On the object. Okay, that's the key point there, on the object, not by the object. Okay, the force is acting on the object. So if we had, for example, um, here, simple example for you, ready? We've got a plank of some sort that's connected to another plank, and it's sitting on top of it. And a lot of the time you'll see wood that is laminated, where the layers are laminated, and there's some sort of a bolt that goes through these right here. Okay, now maybe there's, whoops. Maybe there's another one on top of this one here. That goes to right there, another one connecting there. Okay, that's possible also. But the idea here is that that red bolt 
goes through the two different members. There are two planks on the floor, or maybe there are two beams that are connected with some sort of a bolt. Now, if I stand on either one of these beams, what the beam wants to do is bow out a little bit. The beam wants to do this. If I were to apply a downward force on either side of that, the beam wants to bend, right? It wants to actually bend a little bit itself. So what we would have is, we would have a pin and several beams. If I wanted to know whether or not this structure is gonna remain where it is, I would test the pin first. The reason being is steel or whatever material this would be made out of will nine out of 10 times have a lot more strength to bend than that actual pin will. So there's a good chance that this area will be your point of failure. Well, how do you draw a free body diagram of that? How do you draw a free body diagram and analyze the forces acting on this so as a result you can see if it maybe shears or snaps, that's the term, shears. You're going to see that in the second period today. How would you analyze a free body diagram? What might you do? Draw arrows to the right and left. Say again? Draw arrows to the right and left. Okay, we need arrows coming to left and right from this pin, but how might I draw this pin to start? What might I draw it as? How might I draw my free body diagram? What's an easy way to do this? Box. You could start with some sort of an object. If it's an object, like a box. If it's circular, maybe a point. So let's start with that. So maybe we'll just start with the pin right here, like a bird's eye view. If you're given some sort of an object, you could start with a shape, or you can use a point space. Okay, so let's say this is a pin. We're looking down from above. This is a bird's eye view. Okay, a bird's eye view. When I step on the beam on the right, right, I step on this beam, causing this thing to bow out, the beam is going to pull on the pin this way, to the right. So a bird's eye view would look like this. That's the force that it would feel from this from this bending here, this would bend down, which would pull on the pin. Now this would be drawn to the right. The other force that it would feel would be drawn to the left. Now, the pin may be in a state of equilibrium, but it may still fail. Okay, it may still fail. If the pin is not in a state of equilibrium, then it's going to actually move. Like this whole thing would start to translate and move left to right. So what has to happen is the force on the right-hand side that it feels has to equal the force on the left-hand side for this pin to be in a state of equilibrium. But if those forces get too great, what will happen is this. Ready? Uh, can I demo with something that can actually break? Possibly. So what will happen is this. Uh, so you're going to do this today during the second period. You're going to do a little simulation that's going to talk and explain to you about uh, about bending, about torsion, about shear. So you're going to see that torsion is going to be the twisting. Bending will be if I literally bend. This is called bending moment. Uh, tension will be pulling it. Compression will be pushing it. There's something else called shear. And shear is very difficult to explain. Shear is when there's a force in the bottom one way and a force in the top the other way that push against each other. And over time, if I did that, it would literally snap. See where it snapped? If I literally push this way with the top arm and this way with the bottom arm enough, this bolt might snap. So this is, the, this is an example where the force applied exceeded the sheer strength of this bolt. Well, in this case, if those forces applied exceed the actual material strength of this bolt, it will do what I just did, what I just showed you. It will literally snap like that. That's how this bolt would snap. So the goal in this section is to be able to draw a free body diagram of certain locations, maybe a member. So you're looking at literally one member of a structure, or maybe you're looking at a specific location, what we call a node. I'm calling them pins. We call it a nodal analysis. But you call this a node, a location where two members are joined together. Because those locations are where you're going to most likely see some sort of failure in a structure. Okay? Uh, now, consider is to remember our simple basic trick. And you learned about this in physics last year, but to reiterate, to, to remind you, that if an object is pulled at an angle theta, and that angle theta is with respect to the horizontal, to get the x component, we take the force and multiply by cosine theta to get the y component multiplied by sine theta. Same thing we did last year in physics has to be applied now. Okay, the same idea from physics has to be applied. All right, so for example, see this. For example, you could take a look at this. Imagine there's a member that has a bolt, and there's like five different locations getting, uh, or five different members coming from that one spot, and they're all joined at this exact location. 
what we can do is we can determine first if it actually is in equilibrium. What do we need to figure out if this were in equilibrium? Free body diagram. I kind of have the free body diagram already, but I need something about the free body diagram still. Forces have to like balance out. The forces have to balance out, so we're going to have to check the balance of the forces. But what information is missing from this diagram that I might need to figure out if it's in equilibrium? No, the object itself doesn't matter because I have the forces. Remember, this is a bird's eye view of that same pin. Now there are five steel structures or steel beams coming out from the center that are all joined by this one pin. What do I need still to figure out if this is in a state of equilibrium? How did I figure out equilibrium last year in physics? What do we do to figure out equilibrium? Yeah, you sum the forces. But what's the problem? Can I just add all these forces together? Because no. they're all acting in different... Directions. So what do I need? Negative, negative positive. positive. <laughs> <laughs> negative positive is a good way to put it. I need to know which are negative, which are positive. But I need some sort of a directional, don't I? So I need to look at the x-axis, some of the forces, the y-axis, some of the forces. But to do that... I need something else. Nobody's seeing this. We just talked about it in the previous theta, slide. The angles. What is it? Theta. Theta, the angle. You need angles to do this. So if you have five forces acting in arbitrary directions, you can't find the net force. Because the net force is what? You gotta add them all together? It doesn't make any sense. They're all acting in different directions. So what you need to do is you need to recognize that each of these act at an angle. And that angle indicates whether it's vertical or horizontal or both. For example, Look at the 250 pound force. Which way is it acting? To the right and horizontal. Very good. So the positive x direction. This is literally what we did last year, but with many forces at once. We only did it with like two forces usually. So this is in the positive x direction right here. This one is acting which way? To the right, yeah, but what, which, what other direction? And up. So the positive x and the positive y. This one down here. Positive x. Negative y. This one on the left. Negative x. Positive y. This one over here. And then the 275 would be acting negative x, negative y. It's pretty much your quadrants. Okay, It is. Think about the quadrants being split up by the origin. The pin being the origin. So think about it this way, Marco. Okay, and pre calc you give you a circle? Yeah. Okay, but no, no, but it's, it's the same idea. You know that the row positive in the top right, and you have negative positive, negative negative, positive negative in the bottom right. So you need to break up each of these forces into its components. So let's go ahead and do that if I give you some numbers now. Okay, this is the kind of math that you need to be able to do at a minimum just to even analyze a simple, simple part of a structure. Okay, there's a lot of trig involved, so get ready for it. Now, the one that's drawn in the x, the one that's drawn in the x, I can leave alone, because this is only in the x direction. So already in the x direction and the y direction. In the x direction, I've got 250 already. I'm just going to literally sum all the forces. Now, I need to give you angles, obviously, for this to work. So I'm going to pick some arbitrary angles that look reasonable. You're going to need your calculator, so take that out, please, in order to figure out these numbers. So let's say this angle, shh. Let's say this angle is 50 degrees. This angle is 30 degrees. <laughs> no. We're going to have to do that for all of these forces, Jack. Each one of these are going to get multiplied by it. Yeah. Now, recognize that I'm giving you all the angles with respect to the x-axis, always. So if I told you that this angle was 10 right down here, if this angle down here is 10, what angle are you actually going to use? 80. Thank you, Dirks. The nearest x-axis right here. Okay, 80. So if you're given an angle that is with respect to the vertical, you should actually use the angle in here with respect to the horizontal. 80 and 10 obviously make 90. That's how I know that was 80. Now, in the x direction, the 300 pound force we're starting with, 
I'm not going to stop and go over it again, okay? Because you did learn it in physics. So if you're not listening right now, you might get, you know, run into a bit of a yeah, pickle when you take the actual quiz. That's an easy way to put it. So the 300-pound force acts to the right and up. So positive x, positive y. So I can write this. Positive 300 cosine theta for the x and positive 300 sine theta for the y. Now, in your math class right now, you probably all have your calculator in radian mode. I'm assuming you've been doing a lot of work with radians. If you're going to do anything that involves degrees, such as this, you need to hit mode and make sure it's on degree first. So again, the 300 pound force contributes a pull to the right and a pull up. The pull to the right is represented right here, and the pull up is represented right here. The 250, I only wrote in the X. Why is that again? Because it's only acting horizontally, flat. That's a nice way of putting it, sure. It acts flat or horizontally only to the right. Okay? Had it acted to the left, I would have made it negative 250. So that's the 300 pound force. God bless you. The 310. The 310 pound force. Can somebody break up for me into components? The 310 pound force. It's acting clearly in the X and in the Y. Which is which? Which is positive? Which is negative? Which is cosine? Which is sine? What should I do? Somebody tell me, Ryan, about the 310. Minus from the negative X. 300. For X, it's always cosine. As long as the angle is between the axis and the force. Well, just stick with the 310. Give me, give me the x and y for both. Plus 310 60. Still the same angle you use, yeah. Because remember, Rai, if you use sine of 60, that's the same thing as cosine of 30. They're cofunctions, right? So we break this up, and we recognize that 310 is pulling that way, which is negative x, and it's pulling that way, which is positive y. That's why you see that the x component of 310, 310 cosine 30, is negative. And the y component of 310, 310 sine 30, is positive. 275. Somebody else? 275. James, do it for us. Uh, negative 275. Shh. Guys, be quiet. Listen. Negative 275. Okay, and then what about the y direction? Very good, James. Okay, so what he recognized, obviously, is that this force right here pulls to the left, which is negative x, and it pulls down, which is negative y. So both the x and y components are negative for this last one, or for that one. And now for the last one, the 200 pound force still. The 200 pound force, the 200 pound force. Julia? Um, would it be plus 200. Be careful. Remember use the angle that's between, uh, yeah. yeah. Always between the force and the x-axis if we're gonna use the cosine sine this way. Okay. And then minus 200 sine. All right. Now, what do you have to do, obviously? You have to literally just type it all on your calculator. Type the whole X line in your calculator, hit enter. If you don't get zero, it's not in a state of equilibrium in the X direction. Okay, if you don't get zero. If you don't get zero in the Y direction, it's not in a state of equilibrium in the Y direction. What do you get in the x direction? Type it in, please. Check on your calculator. No, no, I just picked the angles from the side. You had the angles based on the other side. 
Let's hear it. Well, just keep in mind, ready? Listen, please. In the x direction, we have three forces to the right and two to the left, right? If you look at the x direction, three of them are pulling right and two are pulling left. But it matters, the angle and the actual force matters a lot. So although there are more forces pulling to the right, you could end up with a negative number still and say that the two to the left are overcoming it, but I don't know. Pat, what did you get for your x when you sum them all together? Are you in degree mode? Yeah. Marco, what did you get? I don't know. Just tell me what the number is. Uh, negative 349. Negative 49? Negative 49. I got her negative 49 twice. No, because again, guys, remember, listen. Let me explain this. Shh, listen, listen. This 200... This 200 is mainly acting down, not really to the right much, and it's a weak force. 250 is another low force, even though it's acting all to the right. 300 is pretty strong, but it's acting at a 50 degree angle. These two forces are primarily acting to the left because this angle is so small. So these two forces end up overcoming the sum of these three in the X, <laughs> which gives you an overall X of negative 49. Jack? Negative 49 if I were to round it approximately? Oh, so that's fine then. How about the Y direction? Shh. Guys, you need to check this. If you're not getting this number, you're clearly not typing it in right. There's a good chance you're not closing your parentheses after the trig part. After every angle you type in in the trig part of your calculator, you have to close your parentheses. So please do that. And I think the calculator puts parentheses only around the angle, which is fine. So you can do 300, sine 50, and then close those parentheses. What do you get in the y direction? What do you got, Marco? That's fine. That's fine. Check it, please. OK. I'll agree with the statement of 93.8. So what does this mean? Here's what this means. Ready? If this, if this structure, if this structure were built, this object, not only is it not in equilibrium, even if it's in equilibrium, it could still fail because of what I showed you earlier, shear stress. Shear stress could still cause it to fail even if it's in equilibrium. But this object feels an overall force that way and that way. So literally, it would not stay still. It would actually move on its own. Because there's a net force, there must be acceleration. F equals MA. So if you ever get something that has this, it means this is not a stable node. This node in the middle is unstable. Okay, in order for a bridge, or a boom lever, or a truss, T-R-U-S-S, -S, not trust, but truss. A truss structure to be stable, every node Every nodal analysis or every node that you analyze has to be in a state of equilibrium, okay, for it to make sense. Take a quick break. Quick break. Hurry back, please. A little bit different. Yesterday we looked at forces and specifically looked at like an example of uh, a pin or a node to see if there's an equilibrium. Today we're going to take a look at things that create bending or torque. Um, what was the idea of bending from that simple simulation we did yesterday? There are five types of forces we had talked about in that simulation. Isn't that when one part, they use the middle bar, so one part, the forces go in opposite directions and also come together? So it's compressing and tension? Uh, for bending, there's compression and tension. Very good. So when you bend something, depending on the orientation you bend it in. So if I took this bend and bent it this way, it would start to bow like that, right? And when I bend it this way at the top, we'll have tension on it because the members want to separate. That's tension. The bottom of this, is, and I'm doing with it actually a pop stick and I'll show you. So if you bend the, the top versus the bottom of this, yeah. so if you bend this this way, 
What's happening is on the top, these fibers on the top, they want to separate, they want to pull apart. So they bend it like this. So the top of this bar is in tension. And the bottom of it is in compression. The bottom parts, they want to push together. They're literally squeezing together. And this specifically, which way do you think this will fail? Under tension or compression when I bend it? Will it fail on the tension side or the compression side? Tension. Yeah, this will most likely fail on the tension side. So what happens is you start to see it split. If you can see it in slow motion, you'll see the top part here separates from right here. Okay, literally when it starts to split, the top piece right there just came off from there. And that makes sense that it would fail on tension. The reason it would fail on tension in this example is because of the placement of the wood itself. Yeah, sure, it's very difficult to compress this, right? How do you compress something like this? It's very difficult. It's impossible. I'm trying to squeeze this together, it's not working. I can twist it. That was torsion. Have you guys had a torsion right there when you twist it? Um, but the idea of bending is what creates what's called a moment. When something is bending at all, when there's a force applied at a given distance, there has to be a moment or a torque involved. Um, in, in class last year, we didn't go over torque. We didn't go over the idea of it. But the idea is, imagine if you're applying a force at a distance from some sort of a rotating axis. So if, you know the flagpole out there? This is a great example of something where there's a moment or bending. Um, if for some reason somebody were hanging on the end of the flagpole, it would cause the flagpole to want to do this, right? To bend on the side of the building. And usually what we call that is, uh, is like a, a cantilever. The idea of a cantilever, C-A-N-T-I, L-E-V-E-R, cantilever, lever, lever. The cantilever beam is like uh, a diving board in the summertime. When you jump on the end of the diving board, you're jumping on the end that's free to too high over, right? The other end has to be fixed or else it wouldn't work, right? Or else it would flip over and hit the head. So the end of the diving board is the equivalent of like the end of the uh, flagpole if there was something hanging off the end of it. Now, why is this important? Let's think about how apparent this is in real life, and it's incredible. There are so many things that are modeled by cantilever beams. So just to reiterate what a cantilever beam looks like. It's a beam that's fixed into a wall at one end, and the other end is free. So this is literally into the wall. Like it's notched in the wall, and there's probably some sort of a support that's holding it in place. Something that's keeping this here. Okay, it's not sitting like just like connected to the wall. It's not like we took two pieces of wood and glued them together nicely. That wouldn't be the same effect. The cantilever literally means anchored into the wall. So with the diving board, you can see how this is clearly a diving board, right? Bounce on the end of it, and you bounce off into the pool. That would be the end that's fixed. Now, take this concept and rotate it 90 degrees. In your mind, rotate it so you see this now. Okay, so this would be fixed in the ground by some sort of support or anchor. Okay, it's going to be anchored into the ground there, and this is the actual beam coming off. Well, this example is the same as this example. Here's why. With a cantilever beam, the weight of the actual beam always pulls down from the middle. That's the dead load, remember from yesterday's lesson. The dead load is the weight of the actual object. Now, if it's snowing, and for some reason snow accumulates on top of this beam or this thing that's protruding from the building, the snow would be considered not a dead load, a live load, okay? An active live load, that's fine. And that value is going to vary depending upon the time. So if you're in the beginning of a snowstorm, it's very small live load. As you get towards the end of the snowstorm, it's probably the maximum live load that you have for from the snow. Now, on the right-hand side, though, haven't you seen things like this before? Where have you seen something like this on the right-hand side? Again, obviously, this we see coming out of buildings. These are cantilever beams. Where have you ever seen something like this that could be considered analogous to this? So you need a force applied this way, right? Some applied force, either that way or the other way. Where have you seen something like this before? What is it? Flood walls. Flood walls? Yeah, some sort of a barrier. Now this would come out in the third dimension, right? It would be a wall. It's a good example. So you have a force acting against a wall. That's literally what a cantilever beam would be. It would be modeled the exact same way. Now, that force would be a distributed load. Remember yesterday we talked about distributed and then point loads. Distributed loads act along the entire surface. So what Ryan is giving an example of, if there's water pushing up against this, and this was some sort of a barrier, it would be a distributed load acting against that barrier, like a dam. 
buried a dam would be. What else? Where else have you seen anything like this before? Think about coming out of the ground or coming out of a surface or there's some cool thing. A stop sign? Have you ever seen a stop sign on a really windy day? The stop sign will actually fluctuate a little bit. You'll see that there is some bending in the stop sign itself. Well, the stop sign, right, the head of the stop sign would be up here. Okay, there's the octagon right there. And the wind would be pushing against it. And then the stop sign would cause this thing to bend a little bit back like that. And then maybe bend back this way. And it would go back and forth fluctuating, showing that it's bending in both directions. Stop sign, good. I was thinking of a, yeah, a tree. A tree works. A tree is literally a cantilever beam when there's wind. That's what a tree is. A billboard sign is a cantilever beam. Um, now, this is one that's really interesting that most people don't know about. Inside of your body, inside of your arteries and veins, there are little hairs coming off the inner wall of your veins. These little hairs are very fine. And believe it or not, they're cantilever beams along the inside of your veins. So imagine the inside of your vein is like a tunnel. So let's take, for example, this little PVC pipe. This is your vein, all right? And inside of the vein, what you have are these little hairs extending from the inside of the wall up, all from the inner, inner line of your veins, your arteries. And what they do is they actually are able to regulate the flow of blood. If blood is flowing faster, these little hairs are going to bend further. Think about blood flowing past these little, the little sensors in your veins. Little, little sensors are coming off the walls of your, rush, of your veins, and they're little like cantilever beams coming off the walls. And as blood flows faster, those little hairs bend more. So based on how much they're bending, your body actually is able to regulate your pulse and your blood flow in other means than just knowing if you need oxygen. So if your body is overworking and your heart is pumping like crazy, your body actually is telling itself to slow down, to calm down, because these things can sense how fast your blood is actually flowing through your body. Um, obviously, you know, your heart valves open and close at the same pulse rate, so that's another way of also maintaining the correct flow rate of the blood in your body. So when we look at this section, we're going to look at examples of not only cantilever beams, but what about beams that are fixed on both ends, which is pretty much the equivalent of a bridge. Right? A bridge would be like this table, if it were fixed on this end, and fixed on this end, and you would have like some sort of supports on both sides. Uh, so a beam that's connected here and on the other side is what we're really going to focus on, because we're going to look, you know, not specifically, but primarily at structure like bridges and trusses. This example here, though, a cantilever beam, is going to be your next project. The next project on boom levers, that topic I was talking about yesterday, and I'll explain a lot more about what it is, is really just a cantilevered beam. And it's either supported like this, or like this. What's the difference in those two supports? The support in red versus the support in blue. If I apply a force and we reinforce this beam that's extruding from the wall with a red and the red is just a red color. With another beam or another cross brace, or you really call it a truss right here, if you support it here, how is it different than supporting it from what you see in blue? What's the difference in these two arrangements? How would one benefit the other? The direction. Good. The direction has a big part of it. What does the direction imply? What does the direction imply? Like imagine you only had the red one, right? How would it support it? And then if you only had the blue one, how would it support it? Use terms from yesterday's lab or like the interactive thing you did online. Use the words in it. Solid force, like that conquers the force that the force of gravity of the object that you download is going to counter and you pull up. So the bottom one absorbs it, the top one pulls. What are those terms? What terms are we using? Work. Yeah, the bottom would be in compression. Think about it for a second, ready? So here's the support right here. Here's my arm, it's the other support underneath it. If I start pushing down, it's going to cause my arm to buckle, to break like that. This would literally snap, right? If there was too much weight on the end of this, this little red support would eventually just snap inward. It would buckle. Do you know what buckling means? Have you ever had your knee buckle in sports before? Anyone ever have to get 
like an ACL or MCL surgery, or if their knee buckle. When your knee buckles, you get buckled very easily, like that, just need buckle, like that. If somebody kicked the back of your knee up, that's what buckling is, really. Now, if your knee buckles the wrong way, then that's when you have to get surgery. So it's, it's not meant to buckle this way. So structures like columns that support a lot of weight have a tendency to exhibit the phenomenon of buckling before they actually do anything else. And buckling is a little bit odd. It's compression for sure. Right? If I have this column right here and I push down on it with weight from above, it's compression now. Compressing it. Eventually though, the middle is going to snap and it buckles outward. And that's what you see in red. So in red, we can say that this member is in compression. I should just use red actually if I'm going to stick with the red theme. Okay, this member is in compression. Now, in blue, what we're seeing is that if I had a cable, like on a suspension bridge where it's suspended, the cable is being pulled back, the actual object is under tension now. Because this wants to pull down, which means that, and let me give the example. Okay, this object, imagine, imagine that this desk right here is a cantilever beam. Here's the wall right here. This cable would be connected like this, okay, to support the weight of this. This weight wants to pull down, which pulls on the end of this cable. This cable end is fixed. If I pull on this end, and this is fixed, I'm pulling in tension. I'm literally pulling this apart from the trunk. When it's under here, though, it's compressing, and eventually it would, like, snap. It would buckle. If you, I'm not going to, I, I wouldn't have enough strength to do it as it is, but if you put enough force on it, the steam starts to bend underneath. But when you bend this enough, it will buckle out. So the bottom would feel under compression. The top, again, though, would be in tension. The top would be in tension. Which design will you use for your boom lever? Okay, that's the real question you have to start with. Part of the research you're going to do, this is going to come on Friday, part of the research you're going to do is you're going to try to figure out which range you want. Do you want compression or do you want tension? Or do you want to do both? Technically, you can try to do both. There is a way to get both of them involved. It's a little more difficult. But the goal of the upcoming project is going to be to get the highest weight with the smallest mass. So it has to hold the most weight with the smallest mass. So it's the ratio. So if Jack goes a boom lever and his is this big contraction that holds like 50 pounds, it's pretty impressive. And then Pat goes a boom lever that's like a tenth of the mass of Jack's and it holds half the weight, 25 pounds. That would be a better design because the ratio of weight to mass is high. You want to hold as much weight as possible with as little mass as possible. And what you'll realize is this, and actually you realize this. Who can answer this question from yesterday? Which material behaves worse out of the ones you looked at in tension? You remember from yesterday? Think about the materials portion of yesterday. Some of you got to it, some didn't, I know. But there was a part where it was materials. You remember which material behaved very poorly in tension? Brick or in general? Iron? No. Cast iron did also was brittle. Cast iron, brick, there was one other that's used widely all the time that's like brick. No. Concrete stone. Con <laughs> concrete stone, brick are the same idea. Those materials are extremely, extremely weak in tensile strength. That's why you never see like uh, a concrete suspension cable. When you're on a bridge and it's a suspension cable, what are they made of? Steel. Steel has the highest tensile strain of any material that we use readily. I, mean, I would say no, but there are materials that are like man-made that are stronger in tensile strain, but you can't use them to fabricate a bridge. Steel has the highest tensile strain. That's why the suspension cable is made of steel. But what about the supports, the little columns on a bridge, those things that they're using for their mock bridge for the science club? See those little posts right there? Yes. Those are going to be used to support the actual bridge. What material is that made of when you go over a bridge, you know? It's concrete. Why is it concrete there? Why is the support concrete, yet the suspension cable steel? Steel is stronger in tension. That's really what's important. Weight is not really, actually, it's not that much lighter. Weathering of it underwater. OK, that would, they would probably treat it with something so it doesn't weather. But there's another reason. What is concrete really great in? Compression. You can't compress concrete. You walk on concrete sidewalks for a reason. You literally can walk on concrete sidewalks forever and never wear down. It might be dirty over time, it might start to crack because of weathering. Remember the temperature effect? 
As temperature changes, you get cracks in concrete, in asphalt, or in some sort of uh, roadway. There's always cracks in it because you have that shear. When it gets really, really hot, the concrete expands and wants to push against each other like an earthquake, and they're shearing. When it gets really cold, the concrete contracts, so it literally wants to fall apart into different sections and breaks apart. So the idea of concrete is very important that you use it in compression. But in tension, you're going to use things like steel, something that can be pulled apart not very easily. Now there's one other type of concrete. <coughs> there's one other type of concrete, not regular concrete, but another type. Anybody remember what it was called? It was a term. When you have, so imagine you have concrete, all right, so there's a concrete block. And then in that concrete block, you get steel running through the concrete block like this. Reinforced. Yeah, reinforced or just simply rebar is the term for these. It's reinforced concrete. Why do you think concrete might have steel bars going through it? Exactly. To balance that tension force that it can understand. <laughs> Concrete cannot withstand any tension, but if there's steel inside of it, and the concrete starts to bend, the steel will take on the load, it will absorb the force, it will absorb the bend. The concrete will not have to, and as a result, if the concrete bends a little bit, it won't break because it's not really taking on the force of the bend. So you can take a piece of concrete like that and bend it, and it won't actually break. You take a piece of concrete regularly and try to bend it, it will break at the top right away, wherever there's tension. Okay, so when you're bending, and this is something you probably saw yesterday, when you have something that's in bending, like so, this is what Julia was pointing out in the beginning, the top right here is in tension. The bottom is in compression. And as a result, usually, when you put reinforced concrete, you reinforce usually one of the sides if it's going to be of value, or if it's going to be an arrangement where it always bends the same way. Okay? In this case, you would reinforce the top with rebar. Because where is concrete going to fail? It's going to fail in tension. The bottom where it's being compressed, the concrete is not going to compress. But it will crack at the top, and then you know what will happen? Once it cracks at the top, if there's no reinforcement, I'm saying, if it cracks at the top, let me zoom in so you can see this. All right, so you're applying a moment. You keep applying a moment more and more. Here's what's going to happen. Ready? It's going to start to crack at the top like that. It will literally crack in a small spot. But what will happen to that crack? Yeah, it'll spread. It'll propagate is the term we use. And when I took material science, or actually material science in both, that and mechanics of solids, mechanics of solids are studying these ideas. Material science are studying the microstructure of materials, like the chemistry behind it. When I took those classes, you know what we learned about? We learned about samples of materials that naturally do crack, and then what you have to consider is like a factor of safety. Remember the term factor of safety earlier in the year? It was the idea that, well, this object can withstand a certain amount of force, but we don't want to get up to that amount of force. We want to maybe only ever get to three quarters of that limit, so we can't even come close to failing. Well, in this case, a crack at a certain location will cause a factor of safety or some sort of factor of increase of stress. It's the same idea as a piece of wood that has a knot in the wood. So, I wasn't here when you do it, but in science club the other day, we were drilling for a piece of wood that we needed. And when doing so, what I noticed was that, see how there's like this little ring right here, called a knot in the wood? Wherever there's a knot, it's a concentration of weakness in wood. So if this wood is going to fail somewhere, there's a good chance that it will fail at one of these locations. These are where your weak points are. I mean, even here, you can literally see how much material is missing from the wood where there was a knot right here. So in these locations, you have like another factor of safety, or not factor of safety, but a factor of increase, or decrease, whichever way you look at it. You could say that the stress is increased right here, or you could say that the strength of the material is decreased at these locations. Okay, that's like the idea of that factor. Now, if you don't allow that crack to begin by reinforcing the top, it won't propagate to the bottom. Okay, but until you do that and you have something that's weak in tensile strength, it's going to crack and it's going to propagate all the way through. And then this object will just snap. 
Okay, so again, you put rebar on the top, reinforce the top with some sort of a bar of steel, and possibly rebar that's going through the concrete as well. What that rebar will do in black is it will absorb the torque, the, tor uh, the torque or the moment from the actual bending that's occurring. And what happens is it won't actually bend. That, that's an exaggerated example. Okay, I'm showing it bend like that. It will not bend if you have that rebar there. It will cause it from not bending on the top and the concrete on the bottom in compression. This will be prevented because of just simply the concrete itself. Okay, so instead of it being bent, it would look like this. Okay, maybe there is some sort of a bending that's occurring, but it's minimal. You can't even see it because of this rebar that's lining the entire top. That's if it's bending that way. What if it were bending the other way? What if we're bending the other way? This is the more traditional way that you see. Why is it more traditional this way? Yeah, gravity causes things to bend which way? Yeah. yeah. Right? So this is the more traditional way you'll see. Now, what, what causes, well, yeah, what causes an object to bend like this over time? Over time, on its own. You've seen this before. Have you ever been in like an old apartment in the city, or an old staircase, if you're walking down a place in the city, or even in like Brooklyn or Queens? A staircase that's kind of like, you feel like you're not really walking up the staircase in a straight line. The staircase itself is kind of warped. Why does that happen over time? You Anybody know what the term is? But just being used, being walked on so much? Or just deterioration? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a cyclical function, meaning like there's a stress applied, then the person walks off. Then there's a stress applied, the person walks off. The weight of the object is always there. So there's constantly a dead load on objects, and then there's this fluctuating live load that may be periodic in nature, like a bridge. Cars go over the bridge all day long. It's periodic, the force that's applied. So over time, you get what's called creep, C-R-E-E-P. This literally starts to creep downward. Okay, It starts to creep downward, and this is where it's fixed at the end. It's fixed to the wall at the end in both spots. But eventually, this material starts to bend downward because of this. So, in structures, you need to make sure that the tension on the bottom is supported. Okay, there's tension on the bottom and compression on the top. So, the compression at the top is not really what you're concerned with here. It's the tension in the bottom that needs to be supported for sure. All right, let's open another document real quick. Go to Moodle, please. I don't know if I made it visible or not. Take a look at the top. What we're seeing in an example of, first, in the top left, something that is anchored. So let's actually zoom in on the top left. Let's take a look at that one there first. Again, ignore the words on the screen, sorry. So looking at this top left here, what we're going to see is that we have an example of a structure where the beam itself is anchored on both ends. Okay, the beam itself is anchored on both ends. There's some sort of a force that's acting right down the middle. Now. That force acting down the middle is going to want to cause this to do what? Snap yeah, bend or snap in half. So we know that the structure would end up looking like this if that force were able to actually, oh, there it goes. If that force were able to actually bend the beam itself. That's what it would look like, right? Literally, that's what it would look like. So what you're seeing at A and B, see those rotating arrows at A and B? The rotating arrows there are representing the reaction at the support. <coughs> the support would kind of like pull it back in a sense. So the middle wants to do this, right? It wants to bend like that. So there needs to be something that's supporting the bottom. That's why you see the direction of those supports that way. So the A, at the A, it's rotating clockwise, uh, counterclockwise, and B, it's rotating clockwise. So those two moments are showing that they would be supporting in opposite directions, because each end would be pulling down a different way. Now, the values you're seeing here, PL over 8, PL over 8, represent 
the actual torque or reaction moment at the support. So if you need to know how much your wall fixture, where it's anchored, needs to be able to support, if you have both ends anchored with some given force, let's say the force, let's put in numbers now, let's say the force is a thousand newtons, and let's say the length of the entire beam, let's say the whole length is 12 meters, the length, the length should be horizontal, it's kind of uh, if the whole length is 12 meters and the force applied is 1,000 newtons, you can find out the amount of moment reaction at each end. FEM, fixed end moment. Fixed end moment. Okay? Now, what you'll recognize <coughs> is that this example is assuming that the force is applied where? In the middle. In the middle. If it's applied in the middle, this is quite simple, right? It really is. Take, you know what, the force times the length of the beam divided by 8. And that's it. And it's the same on both sides because of symmetry. So this is your most simple example that is possible here. Now, look at the one below it. What's the difference? It's somewhere else that's not the middle. Yes, yeah, more to the right. That's a good way to put it. So it's at some arbitrary distance, A or B, from the end. Lowercase b is traditionally written to represent the distance from fixture B. Lowercase a is written to represent the distance from A. So if you fill in numbers here, and we say that we'll still use the same overall length of 12. Let's say that this A value is 7 and B is 5, and the force is still 1,000 newtons. Okay, 7 meters and five meters. I'm going to make them obviously the same, not the same uh, proportional as what it looks like in the diagram. Maybe the A4. So seven and five, here's the difference now. Take a look. The amount of moment that it supports is the force times the other distance squared. Take a look at that. The moment support A <coughs> is really a function of the other distance on the other end is squared times the distance A is from the force. You really, if you're not looking up, you're probably not going to even understand this later on, so I really hope you can just study it over. Again, B is the smaller distance on the right side, not the one representing the closest to A. This distance has more of an effect because it is squared than this distance A. Granted, this number is larger, this number, though squared, is going to become 25 times 7. So when it's over here at this end, this number gets squared. But on this end, take a look what happens. The moment you feel over here is a squared, which is 7 squared, times this 5. So this becomes 7 squared times 5. This becomes 5 squared times 7, which is larger. Uh, a squared is the, the, the uh, 7 squared times 5, or 5 squared times 7. Yeah. 7 squared times 5, but you're squaring a bigger number, right? Yeah. So here, you'd be squaring 7, you'd be squaring 7 times this 5 all over the overall length squared. This is not changing, P is not changing, A and B are not changing, right? So you're going to have a higher fixed end moment on this end because the force is closer to that end. Okay, whichever end the force is closer to creates the higher moment. Again, the moment is like a reaction force. The normal force, remember the normal force? It reacts to the weight of the object. The moment reacts to the bending or the torque on the object. Okay, the moment is a reactive torque. It's not a reaction force, it's a reaction that acts as a torque. Like it, op it opposes the desire of the object to bend. It opposes the desire of that object to bend. Let's go to the right now. We'll come back to that in a moment. Huh? In a moment? No? Wow. No sense of humor. It's crazy. It's a terrible joke. I know that. But you could at least acknowledge it. <coughs> what do you see here with this diagram now? Anyone have any idea what's going on at B? It's not looking good. Yeah. It's a roller joint. Very good. A roller joint. Now, what's happening there? Relax. 
What's happening there? It's fixed on one end. It's fixed on this end, right? It's anchored. But what about this end? There's no equation to solve. Yeah, you notice there's nothing here? There's no equation down here? The reason it is, is because that end is like this, right? Imagine anchoring into the wall on this end. So I literally anchored the support. And on this end, it's literally just the platform that rests on. When it rests on the platform, the platform pushes back up. So if there's a force pulling down, it pushes back up. But this object is free to bend on this end. This little circle here represents that there's nothing preventing lateral motion. The previous diagram, let's go back and show that so you can see. Look at this diagram here. At this, at this location right here, this literally cannot separate. If this fails, it's going to crack right here. This literally cannot separate. It's anchored into the wall. Now look at this one. Here, it's anchored, so this will not separate. But if this thing starts to bend, here's what's going to happen. It's going to bend like this, and eventually it might even slip off of the roller on the right side. The right end will bend, and this might actually slip off of here. Maybe this is the end of the actual material, and it will literally bend too much to the point where it will slip and fall through. So that end is not fixed. When an end is not fixed, we consider it to be like a pin. Does a pin prevent anything from rotating? Like a hinge. Does a hinge prevent rotation? No, it actually provides rotation. A pin, anything that is pinned, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, something that is pinned. Uh, okay, here's an example. If I had, this is hard to see right away. If I had this object here, and there's a hole drilled through it, and I take. Take this metal rod and push it through here. Right. Oh, it, was, it worked out because it was made for this actually. It was drilled for no reason. So, what you have here, obviously, right, this can be simply supported like that. This is not needed. The idea is that we want to see what happens when this pin is free. So, this object itself can rotate very easily because there's nothing preventing torque. It's motion. It's perpetually moving because this, this side is actually heavy. So, it's kind of like looking through every time. That side's catching up. So this is not preventing torsion or, uh, or torque at all. It's letting it, it's allowing it to rotate. Not to make it so the idea here is that this is free to rotate. There is literally nothing preventing it from rotating. Eventually it will become stable like that. This is more mass on this side. If you put it this way, it will stay for a moment until you turn it a tiny bit, and then what'll happen? It'll fall out of the log it'll be stable like that. If you're interested in that idea, this is a whole class on that's literally what I just did. It's called nonlinear dynamics and chaos. Literally, this is called a stable point, but under certain perturbation, it will change and automatically return to an actual stable point, which I have its own body. Anyway, that's besides the point. This can rotate freely because there's no torque preventing it from moving. This, what you're seeing, is what this end is. This roller is literally that. Okay, that's what it is coming out of the board. So this is just sitting on the end of it. It can easily rotate freely about that point. So, so for this one, we're going to see that there is no equation on the right-hand side. That's all rusty. So there's no equation on the right-hand side. That means... That means that on the left-hand side, all of your torque is being prevented at that one anchor. So what do you think about if all the torque is being prevented on this side alone? Which will be more structurally sound? This or this? Yeah, this one will be more, a, a, yeah, A is a support. But this setup is more structurally sound. We'll continue with this tomorrow or Friday, okay? This side would be a little bit weaker on the right here. So we spent some time, Mike, we spent some time last class looking at the idea that when a force is applied on some sort of a member that's fixed on both ends, there's some sort of torque generated. And the idea of torque is what you're really doing with the boom levers. The boom lever is exactly what you're seeing here, except it's only fixed at one end. So look at the top right diagram right here. 
This is what you're seeing for the Bumalever, except if this were literally free, if there were nothing here. That's what you're doing with the Bumalever. It's called a cantilevered beam. Uh, if those of you, or if any of you are interested in like architecture and art in general, um, Mr. Trailer, do you know who Mr. Trailer is? In the business office? Works with Mr. Nats? He does have glasses. He does have glasses, yeah. yeah. White hair. And white hair, yeah. yeah. Real nice guy. Okay. So he, he listen, uh, he's extremely, extremely knowledgeable. And the other day I was talking about cantilever beams and he's like, Oh yeah, there's, a, there's an architect that does all of his work using cantilevers, and I had no idea. Um, but it, he gave me the term, I can put it on Moodle, I'll put a news, a news form link to it. But the idea is that this architecture designs everything cantilevered, which is kind of weird. It's, it's very RC of him, I guess, to do this. Um, having every structure come off some sort of a platform and being free. So even part of like a building will come out and be jutting out from the side and be like unsupported on one end will always be cantilevered. Um, I, don't, I don't know why that's really important. He just likes the way it looks, I guess. Uh, now, how do you think you're going to use the rest of this table? How do you think you're going to use the rest of this table? For example, how do the diagrams differ from top to bottom? What's the only difference, really? Yeah, exactly right. The weight distribution. Here, in the first diagram, if you have a single force applied in the midpoint. In the second diagram, if you've got a single force applied at a random location. In the third diagram, now you've got two forces that are being applied and they're applied a third of the way in from each side. Then you've got three forces applied a quarter of the way in from each side. And you can continue this over and over and over with five forces and six forces until you think about it overall as what we call a distributed force. And that's what you're seeing in the bottom left here. Let's take a look specifically at this diagram now to understand what a distributed force means. So W is traditionally the variable that you use for distributed force. P is for a point load. So this distributed force, this distributed load, acts on the entire span of the member. So this would be considered like the dead load. The dead load of an object acts throughout the entire body of it, not just in the middle. In physics, we talk about modeling like the center of mass, or the center of an object as where it actually, the weight pulls down. But realistically, on a bridge, the weight is being pulled down at every location, right? Every single bridge span, like bridges are not one entity, right? We know that I've talked about this before. For a bridge, because of thermal expansion and because of weathering, the bridge needs to have some sort of like a, a locking mechanism that can allow it to expand and contract. So as a result, these sections of the bridge each have a certain amount of weight. Well, you're not gonna draw a bunch of like different weights in the center of each section, it's modeled like this where W is this distributed load as a function of length. So the units for W will not be newtons, they'll be like newtons per meter. Okay, newtons per meter. The reasoning, again, is that here, your units of force are simply like, I don't know, something like say, 1,000 newtons. Okay, that's for the early one up top when you have three of those forces. But here, this is a certain amount of force per distance. So this would be a certain amount of newtons per meter. So the units on a distributed load are different than the units on a regular force point load. Okay, you know that forces are measured in newtons, but because this is distributed per meter, it's a certain amount of newtons measured per meter. Okay, newtons measured per meter. It's force over distance, really. Okay, force over distance. That's what the actual value of W is measured in. How does the diagram below this differ? How does the diagram directly below this differ from that? What's the difference in these two diagrams? Yeah, this second scenario is looking at an example where the distributed load only acts for half the member. Only acts for half the member. Um, in the bottom, is it L over 2 because it's only acting on half? Where are you seeing L over 2? Like L on the, is he in that same diagram mm -hmm. below? Yes, so the dimension there, this L over 2, sorry, yeah. This dimension is indicating that it's half of whatever the overall length would be. Yep, that's why earlier, even here, so if you go back, they use L over 4, see that? And L over 3. So whatever, the length is unknown. The whole idea is to write an algorithm in order to solve for any parameters. So if I give you any value of L, any value of P, uh, that's really it. L and P are the numbers. Now, unless you're earlier where we had A and B, where A is some length and B is another length. 
Okay, but you have to be given all those values in order to do this. I have a practice worksheet for you to work on so you can understand how to see this stuff in action. So that's one for half. Now, the one below it, this next one is actually one that's very, very, very frequently occurring. The idea is that the load gets lesser and lesser as it gets toward the end. Okay, the actual load is focused mainly on this end, and by this end, there's no load whatsoever. And the load itself is distributed in some sort of a linear fashion. Meaning that there's most force here, even less force as we move over, less force, less force, less force until here, there's no force applied at all. Okay, there's no force at the very end of the object. Uh, the last one is one that in, in our engineering classes we didn't even use much to be honest. But this is where you have some sort of a point in the center where the mass is mainly focused. Can anyone think of an example of that? Where the center of a span has all the mass focused on it? Where the center of it does? It's not obvious at all. Not one bit. If for some reason you're studying the pyramids, okay, the structure that is the foundation of the pyramid has the most mass where? Well, right in the center. Think about a pyramid shape, right? Comes to an apex. So most of the mass is concentrated down the center of the pyramid. As it moves outward, there's less and less dead load, mass, weight, pushing down on the foundation. So the foundation at the bottom of the pyramid on the outside has the least amount of stress. But at the very center of the pyramid is where the stress is focused because of the shape. And that's what made me think of a pyramid simply looking at the shape. Okay? Um, i trying to think of other examples. Something that you would use in real life, not a pyramid, obviously. Um, hmm. Let me think. If something pops in my head, I'll try and give you one. Okay? Um, this last one here, okay, this last one has to do with determining the amount of stress on an object based on how much the material has bent. Based on how much bend there is in the material, you can determine the amount of stress and the amount of torque acting on the object. I'm not going to give you a mathematical example of this, but the idea I want you to understand is this. E is called Young's modulus. E is like K from physics. What was K in physics? Constant. Spring constant. Good, constant or spring. Uh, mu K was friction, mu S was friction, but K itself was the spring constant. The spring constant measured how strong the spring was, how rigid the spring was. E is similar to that. E is called the modulus of elasticity. A spring had to do with an elastic force. They're very similar to one another. So E is a material property. I is also a material property. I is called the moment of inertia. And I has to do with the shape of the actual cross section and the member itself. So I'm not going to give you mathematical approaches to this last one. Okay, but for any of these other diagrams, if I give you something, you should be able to calculate the moment or the torque acting on either end. On either end. And obviously for things that are, that are symmetric, what can you assume? Same. Yeah, and you see that. Look at the formula here, right? Are these the same? But look at the previous line. Are they the same there? Because clearly there's no symmetry there. Okay, so for things that involve symmetry, the end uh, at each, the fixture at each end exhibits the exact same amount of torque on the actual mm -hmm. fixture. Um, on the right hand side, we're going to see that obviously we have the same things, but instead of both ends being fixed, the right end, the right end only had what was called, remember, a roller at the end. Okay, there's a roller at the end that prevents vertical motion but it does not restrict the object from bending more. It could slide, it could slide out. If the bending was enough, it would actually slide and fall. Okay, it could move left to right, but it cannot move up and down because of this roller. It prevents vertical motion only. All right, let's go down a little bit further. Take a look at these diagrams here. We're seeing the same setup that we had previously in these diagrams, okay, but we're seeing that in these, the only difference, the only difference here for this one specifically, you're also given the amount of force at each end. So this, PL over 8, PL over 8, if I scroll back up to the top, we see it again. See PL over 8 there? Again, take a look. PL over 8, PL over 8. This is the <coughs> amount of torque that the end of the fixture has to provide to cause it to not rotate and bend. So these diagrams that we saw earlier show torque at the corners or at the fixtures, at the locations where they're connected. The ones at the bottom also show the amount of force provided on each side. 
And that makes sense. Think about it logically. To be in equilibrium, the amount of force pushing down has to equal the amount of force pushing up. Well, what's pushing down in this diagram? Let me zoom in so you know what I'm talking about. In this diagram right here, what is pushing down? How much force? Literally, how much force? There's no number for it. Don't give me a number. P. P is pushing down. Well, each reaction is pushing back up with P over 2. P over 2 plus P over 2 is just P. Half of P is being pushed back up on this end. Half of P is being pushed back up on this end. That's the amount of force. So again, if you want to label this in your diagram. Did I give you this diagram yet? Yeah. I did. Okay, thank you. This right here is the amount of force pushing back up on both ends. This is the torque on each end. The amount of rotation it has to rotate with. They're different things. And I, I wish I had talked about torque last year in physics because it would make this a lot easier. But the idea of it is that the units of torque, these units are Newton meters. Okay, the units of force are simply Newtons. So if you look at your units in these bottles, they'll be able to give you an idea of what you're actually investigating a little bit. And you can see that the units of torque are Newton meters. What's P times L? P is Newton, L is meters. L is length, P is force. So PL over 8 means Newton times meter over 8. This is going to be a Newton times a meter over 8. Whereas this is just Newton divided by 2. This is just the unit of Newton divided by 2. Okay, so these again are the forces that are reactions. These are the moments or the torques that are reactions. Each of them providing stability for this member. Both have to exist. You need it to be in uh, force equilibrium and rotational equilibrium, both, for an object to be considered stable. Okay, so for it to not fail, I guess you could use that term. Now the second diagram is very similar to the first diagram. Only difference is now instead of it being not at the midpoint, where is it? It's at an arbitrary location, A or B, from one end or the other. So in this case, it's just a little bit more involved math. But again, take a look. This is the amount of moment or torque that is being provided. This is the exact same thing as the diagram earlier. If you scroll all the way up to the top of this, you'll see that in the earlier diagram. But this diagram at the bottom here also provides us with knowledge for the amount of force acting at each of the reactions. The force acting is a little bit complicated here. We're going to see that it looks like it's, well, you have a force times a distance squared times another distance, but it's all over a distance cubed. So distance cubed over distance cubed will cancel in units, leaving you with force. Okay, but the red boxes, again, are the amount of force pushing back up at each end of this fixture. The, the blue circle is the amount of torque or rotational uh, response that each reaction actually has. The third diagram here I'm not going to go into, but just so you're familiar, if you see M in the middle of a member, it means that that member is being torqued in the middle. So there's something that's providing some rotation in the middle, but I'm not going to actually ask you to do that mathematically. Okay, so these first two diagrams you're seeing here are two of your probably most important diagrams right here because they not only provide you with torque, but they also provide you with the force at each reaction. So these should be good enough for you to practice for most things mathematically that you're going to see. The last one don't worry about. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at a mathematical example of this so you can physically use one of these tables. Mm. Let's look at an example of these. Now, again, to do this, you're going to have to have this, keep this figure up, keep it up, and just draw on there, or I can put it up. I'll put it up on the computer so you guys can see. I don't expect you to memorize this. I'm not going to have you memorize it. You're going to be given the figure itself. So really, we're going to be focusing on these bottom left here. Okay, these two are the best ones because they give you the most. Up top, again, we get all these different scenarios, which I might ask you, but these are only about torque. Up top, only torque. All right, so let's look at an example of this. I'm just going to write up an example to give you as a sample. 
So let's say we've got a scenario. Uh, hmm. Let's say on this end it's fixed. There's a beam. This beam is simply supported by a roller. Okay, that's the support that is, is present. We know that there's a certain amount of force acting at this location, let's say right here. And this location is three meters from the left. Fixture. And eight meters from the right fixture with a force of 25 Newtons. Okay, there's the scenario we've got. And all I want you to do, all I want you to do is determine the actual fixed end moment at the anchor support. Here there's never going to be a fixed end moment, so don't have to worry about it because it's free. But here where it's anchored in, it's providing some sort of a moment allowing it to not turn, not bend. So your goal is to figure that out. So what you do right away is you go to your diagram. Okay, you go to your diagram. So let's take a look at our diagram. Now, since we have a roller, okay, the roller is useful on the right, or is used on the right-hand side or demonstrated. At the bottom here, these are all anchored supports. Recognize these are similar to the ones we had a moment ago, but these are all for anchored supports on both ends. Everything is anchored for all these diagrams. But the diagram on the right is not. Which of these diagrams am I going to use on the right? The first? No. Nope. Yeah, the second one. Right? The second one. It just makes sense in this. Look, you've got a distance here, you've got a distance here that I know, and that's what's happening in your diagram. If it was at the midpoint, obviously, use the first one. If there were two forces, each a third of the way in, you go with this one, three, etc. Okay? If it was a distributed load, you would go to that one. So all you actually have to do is utilize this formula right here. It's a simple substitution. Okay, if there's ever any easier math, this is it. All you're doing is substituting in right here. So there's your formula. P, L, P over L squared times the quantity B squared A plus A squared B over 2. So let's write that down. Okay, the fixed end moment at A, the fixed end moment at A is going to be again P over L squared times the quantity B squared A plus A squared B over 2. So all you have to do is plug in. What's L in this case? What's L? Yeah, 11. Okay, please recognize that obviously L is the sum of A and B. L is the sum of A and B. What was A from the diagram? If you don't know, you take a look back at your diagram and you recognize, well, A is the distance from the fixed end. That's what A is denoted as in this diagram right here. So in our figure, A is simply 3. B is 8. L is 11. And P is 25. So that's all you have to do, guys. Take those numbers, plug them in. Now, the idea that you can utilize these tables is extremely powerful because they don't come from very simple math. All of these expressions come from pretty advanced calculus, actually, to come up with that. But I'm giving you the table so that you can apply this idea so you can physically see how much torque is being resisted on that end that's anchored. So how much torque you need to resist width. So you can calculate a number, but all you're doing is really plugging in, right? All you're doing is plugging in. So if you plug in here, if we plug in, we've got 25 over 11 squared times 8 squared times 3 plus 3 squared times 8 over 2. What do we get as a solution for this? Oh, check it again. Paul, what was the 47? Agreed? 
Now my units here are going to be Newton times meter because I'm looking at what's called a fixed end moment. Let me explain what this number actually means. 47.1 Newton meters. Here's what it physically means. Uh, one of these is about a meter, right? So this is about a meter in length. I think it's 36 inches. Yeah. 36 inches is 3 feet, close to a meter, it's not exactly a meter, right? Now, can somebody really quickly Google, Google uh, 47 newtons to pounds. Convert 47 newtons to pounds. 47N to LB. 47N to LB. 10 point? Alright, so around 11 pounds, right? So this is what it means. This wall, Right here, this anchor support is resisting bending of about 11 pounds a distance of a meter away. So this is the equivalent of me holding this end fixed, right? So imagine that I, I drill a hole in the wall, I then take this, I slide it into the wall, okay? I take this object, I drill a hole in the wall, I slide it into the wall, that's what anchor means. When you see this diagram, it means it's literally embedded into the wall. So here's the wall gripping the anchor or the wall acting as an anchor. If I apply an 11 pound force, one meter away, that's what it's feeling. It has to resist an 11 pound force. Now, would this material be enough to do that, you think? No. Probably not. I don't think so, at all, actually. Okay, 11 pounds on this would probably end up causing it to bend enough that it might snap. Okay, I'm just trying not to fight. Okay, but the idea of what this number signifies in magnitude, it is physically what it means. This is a small scenario with only 25 newtons. 25 newtons is a very small amount of force. It's only about 5 pounds of force. So this example is one that's like, you know what, there's only 5 pounds of force acting on this. It's not a lot. But if you're looking at a building or a structure, these numbers turn into like thousands of newtons, not 25 newtons suddenly. Um, let me see if I have another one I want to work on with you. All right, let's do this one now. Let's do, let's do one that's fixed on both ends that's a little bit different. So I want you to determine the following. Determine, there's going to be four answers for this. Determine the moment at each end and the force at each end. The reaction moment and the reaction force of the following diagram. Uh, let's see. So here's your scenario. You've got a member. This member is, I'm going I'm to color in the member so you can see what it actually is signified by. Okay, there's the member down the middle right there. And you've got this force, or this distributed load, we call it right here, that's acting across the entire member with a certain amount of pressure, really. It's not specifically pressure, you'll think of it like that. 300 newtons every meter. 300 newtons every meter. Well, this is 55 meters. So we're really looking at around 1,500 newtons of force acting on this. But it's not acting right in the middle. It's acting distributed evenly across the whole surface. So we need to figure out which of these table diagrams we're going to utilize for this. So we go to our table, right? Let's go to our table here. And we're going to see that we've got a bunch of scenarios. Well, first of all, our diagram was fixed on both ends, right? So we're not going to be using these this time over here. So we know we can start on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, I can see that one of these looks similar to what we had. Which one is it? Yeah, this one right here. Now, the only issue with this one, the only issue with it, is it only gives us the moments at each end, right? But my question was, find the moment at each end, how much it has to turn with, and what the force applied at each end is going to be also. So to find the force applied at each end, and the moments, we can go down further. 
And we can see this diagram is also represented right here. So let's use this one right here. I'll zoom in on it. Okay, let's use this diagram right here where the cursor is next to it. Because this is a distributed load. It tells us, it tells us that it's got a certain amount of moment on each end. And we have the same number, QL, it was P. PL squared over 12 is the same thing in the other diagram, exact same thing. But now we've got this PL over 2 and PL over 2. In this case, Q. We use Q or W, whatever, it doesn't matter. There. So let's utilize this figure here and figure out what the answers are. And let's make sense of the answers also. Okay, the answers make sense why they are the certain way they are. So let's go back to the diagram. Okay, recognizing that over here, we know that the moment at A is going to be, and we use W in the last one, so I use W. WL squared over 12. Is 12 like fixed? Just... Uh, yes, 12 is fixed. It is not a function of the length, it's a constant, like G. Okay, so 12 is a number based on the actual scenario. And you can see that if you looked at the next diagram, Jack, to follow up your question, when it's not evenly distributed, when there's, a fix, when there's more of a focus in the middle, it becomes 96 and there's a 5. So this fraction is a result of what's called integration in calculus. When you integrate things, you end up getting a lot of fractions. That's the result of that. Uh, all right, so back to the diagram. This is the fixed end on the left. Well, the fixed end on the right is the same thing. Why? Yeah, there's symmetry in the diagram. So the fixed end moment over here, I can look it up in the table, but I'll recognize that it's also WL squared over 12. Now, we also were given some other information about the forces. The force in reaction here is going to be WL over 2. And the reaction of the force at B is going to also be WL over 2. Again, symmetry. Okay, again, symmetry. So we're going to need to figure out just pretty much T2 on the left, and then we know that it's the same on the right. Why is it WL over 2? Let's see who knows their physics or can pick up on this. Why is it WL over 2? W is the force. W is the distributed load. What's L? L is the length. So what's my distributed load? What's the actual number? 300 what? Newtons per meter. Newtons per meter. Well, how many meters do we have here, right? So as a result, if this, again, 300 newtons every meter, 1500. yeah, you get 1,500 by multiplying it, right? And then, if this 1,500 pounds of newtons pushing down, how much do you each reaction have? PL or WL over 2. Add for each. Okay, think about a distributed load. Okay, distributed load, you can think of it as like a point load if you multiply the length of the load that's acting over and the actual distributed load itself. Multiply these two, you get 1,500 newtons, right? 300 newtons every meter times 5 meters gives you 1,500 newtons divided by 2 is 750. So that's easy for part B, right? That answer here is just going to be simply, again, 750. And look at my units. Why are my units newtons? Yeah, the meters cancel out right here. Again, when you take a distributed load and multiply it by the length, the lengths cancel. And as a result, you're getting newtons. Well, why are you getting newtons? Also because you're looking at the reaction force. In the red, we're going to do now, let's do this in red. In red, we're going to see that we're looking at the actual torque that's a reaction. Again, fixed end moment is the reaction torque. R is the reaction force okay, at that location. So this we're going to get 300 times 5 squared over 12. 300 times 25 over 12. I would do probably, well, let's, can we reduce it first? No, I'd probably just multiply it out in my calculator. 625? And these units are Newton times meter. Be careful. I know, there's so many stuff. So distributed loads are newtons per meter. Yeah. Torque or moment is newtons uh, times meters. And you wait and tell, look at your units. 
The units of this W here was newton over meter. This is going to be meter squared. So one of the meters canceled, leaving behind newton meter. Okay, let me show that just so you can see. The units here for W, the units here are going to be newtons per meter. And the units here are meters, but it's squared. So it's going to be times meters squared. So when I look at these units in blue there, I'll see that one of these meters cancels with one of these meters, leaving behind newton times meter, which is that unit right there. Okay, I highly recommend that, I'm going to put a worksheet up on, on Moodle, okay, that you practice this. I gave two examples now for you to see, but from this point you should be able to do any of these. Okay, any of the scenarios just depends on the parameters you're giving to the problem. And you give us the equation sheet. Yeah, you give, you give me the equation sheet and the actual scenario. Now, yeah? In this case, because of symmetry. Okay? Again, because of symmetry, the fixed end moment and the reaction are the same. So 750 is the reaction on each side. 625 newton meter is the torque on each side. And the torque is the same on both sides. The force is the same on both sides. Now, why are these numbers important? The reason they're important is because traditionally, the ends of structures are fixed in a way that you can measure the allowable stress. For example, if one end is fixed with some sort of a bolt going through the beam, maybe you want to measure the sheer stress of the bolt. Okay, shearing, we talked about that, you saw that in that little applet you did online, the little simulation, what you call it. Shearing is those two bolts snap, or a bolt snapping like this. So it's possible that you know the shear strength of a bolt, and that bolt is used to fix this in the anchor. So as a result, you need to know, okay, how much force is actually acting on the reaction? 750 newtons. Can that bolt withstand 750 newtons? If it can, you're good. If not, it's going to shear and it's going to snap because there's too much force acting on that actual friction. So a lot of this math that you're doing here is math that you would do um, to check the stability of a structure. Okay, to check the stability. All right, go to Moodle real quick. Go to Moodle, go to Documents and Handouts. I'm going to put this document up. I'll make it visible right now. So your homework for the next two days is simply to, fill, uh, to finish this worksheet. All right, so it's right here on Moodle. Fixed end moments worksheet. Okay, it will be due on Friday. Tomorrow is Ignatian Awareness. Thursday we have the field trip, so I'll give you till Friday to do it. But remember, Friday this needs to be done, and Friday you have to have all of your supplies. I'm giving you three days now to get supplies by doing this, right? You got Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So 77th Street, the store is called Rainbow. So it's, it's actually a hardware store, is that correct? It's like an Ace. Okay, it's more of an Ace hardware store. So let's choose that as our option and give Jan give Jan hell. Okay, make sure she returns that stuff for you. Well, be nice. Don't be rude, but try to get a return.